Can each of you share from your perspective the importance of having a good relationship with water? Um, and just because the way the film ended, I thought that was a good question to start off of. And I want to give a little just kind of insight or background to an experience that I recently had that I thought was funny. With some of my friends here, we actually went out surfing. And the surf was mild, and it was fine, and it was fun. But when we got out, we were like, oh, you know, the ocean was kind of moody. And it, like at the end of it, I go, you know what? We forgot to greet the ocean, and we forgot to say, like, hi, and we come in a good way, and, you know, we're here to have a good time. And we did have a great time. But remembering that having a relationship with the ocean is super important. So if you guys can each kind of share what that means to you. There's, 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 there's so many things that I, I, I feel like I want to share because there's so many, so many big things that are happening in the film. And per, it's, it's even the story that we see between you know, the great-grandmother ocean or the great-great-grandmother sea, and then you have the, the great-great-grandson. And as the, we wrote a script, and of course we couldn't follow the script, and so what you see as the script now is something that evolved naturally. And it was based on my, not just the character's relationship to the water, but my personal relationship to the water, and the relationship that I have with my maternal great-great-grandmother. And after the, as the movie was going, I realized, wow, this is not just a story about Shaluk, or the guy that's in the film. This is my story. This could be stories of some of our Hawaiian brothers or our Australian folks that, that were removed and we didn't grow up, well, I don't know about everybody here, but didn't grow up around the ocean. And that memory that you talk about, how I found my way back, it's a huge long story that I won't get into right now, but it was that water having memory and not really even understanding my relationship fully until I really followed my intuition or what, I think there's like that honing device that like turtles have, that you find your way back. And so what you see a lot in the film with the waves that, the main waves that were surfing that look good, um, that's where I found my way back to, to that area, to where my great, great grandmother is from. And to realize that is my connection to the sea. And this is something I had no idea about. I wasn't taught that until I had to go to mainland Mexico. And it just came on its own as if I was, again, the, 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 the turtles kind of follow the moon, you know, and, and, and stuff like that, to return to these beaches where we're born, where we originally come from. And I think that is one of the, the points of the film, is, is, is to return to where we're from and to that relationship that we might have into intuitively but maybe never followed it or had the option or the freedom to follow that. So that's, that's kind of what you see is almost like, it's like my story, and I think it's a lot of people's stories. And sometimes we're not even conscious of it growing up. I just remember as a kid, I would have gave like my left arm or my right arm to like live at the coast. I, lived, I grew up in LA and in the valley, in San Gabriel Valley. So it, was like an, it took like an hour to get there, and we went there like twice a year or whatever in the summer but I would have done anything to live like in Newport Beach or in Orange County, like anything closer. And I didn't know why. You know, I didn't really know what was drawing me until later in life. And this area where I'm talking about my mother's, my maternal land, I just realized this, you know, 10 years ago, by going there. So this relationship is something I think that we all have in that memory. What I can say for me, the water is water is a healer. Uh, my grandma, you know, we used to we didn't live close to the ocean. We, I grew up in Durango in Mexico, but my grandma used to take me always to the rivers. We we go to the river and and I, I enjoy that time. And now I live in San Diego, and so I close to the ocean. And whenever I feel like 
you know, I, I, I need to heal from something, you know, even just go in the water and the water is, is cold and, and, and that gets, gets my inflammation down if I have any and give me some, uh, if, if, you know, I, it's kind of like a meditation to, you know, to go in the water. I'm not a surfer, but my kids are. And um, now that I'm uh, work, more collaborating with Native Light Water, so I feel like it's been a lot of healing for me, especially when I started to participate with them. It was a little after my husband passed away, and that is a huge, huge um, uh, thing to do, you know, when you have something like that, just go back in the water and then um, Mark put me one day on a surfboard and took me far there in the ocean. <laughs> and I was, I was enjoying that time, you know, never said, oh, I'm scared or something. I just go for it. And then um, at some point, somehow I drop in the water and it was even better, you know, to go in the water, come back and then make it back to the to the on top of the surfboard and yeah it's just it's been a really good experience to be with with people that are always in the water and i feel safe being around them and and i see the water like like a healer um yeah actually i was going to say something similar about how it's it's very healing to me. In fact, um, whenever I'm feeling sick, like I have a, f a flu or the sniffles or I have a headache or I'm feeling really under the weather, I would I'd go get in my car and drive to the ocean and hop in for 30 minutes, an hour, play around in the ocean. And I feel genuinely better after I get out of the water. There is a healing aspect to the ocean. Um, and for me specifically, I, I can't speak for anyone else, but when I'm in the water, um, I feel free. I feel like a fish. As I feel like that's where I want to be all the time, if only my body temperature didn't drop like 990 <laughs> degrees. Um, and whenever I'm in the water, I don't feel like there's any pressure from the, from the world around me. Not just physically, gravity, but also I feel like I don't have to worry about society. I don't have to worry about this or that. This is a me time and the ocean will take care of me while, while I'm taking this moment to be a, in and a very, a very weird uh, mental image, but in Mother Nature's womb again. Um, it feels like I'm just uh, being a, a child again. When I go into the water, I, I don't think of myself as an adult anymore. I think of, you know what, I'm gonna slap a wave. I'm gonna jump into the water and play around. I'm gonna get a boogie board and just catch a wave or a surfboard and just ride a wave, because it's, it's fun. It is play, like there was a quote in there that uh, one of the core factors of existence is to have fun with it. And when I'm in the water, I feel that. It's healing, it's fun, and it's freeing. And that's my, been my relationship with it. Um, I've had many ups and downs with uh, my journey in the ocean over my life. I've had scares, I've had uh, tough times, I've had mental, breakdowns in the ocean and off of the ocean, but it's never been because of the water. It's always been because the water wants to help me. And so throughout this journey, I've found that having fun and staying safe and healing are the things that I feel when I'm in the water. So those are my, that's where I go to heal and have fun. You know, I take credit for some of your mental breakdowns yeah, in the that's water. <laughs> This guy drives me crazy. <laughs> um, I didn't grow up by the coast. Of, my family didn't grow up by the coast. Uh, so when I was growing up, I always knew that I wanted to try surfing at some point. Um, and then I remember when I got my license and I didn't look back. I bought a surfboard, had a Volvo station wagon, and pretty much every day after school got out, or every weekend, uh, I'd be at the beach. And, you know, at first it was very much like, this is for me, this is just for me, you know, this is where I can be alone, this is my time uh, for me and my friends. Uh, but as I got older and spent more time with my elders and learned more about where my family comes from, where everyone comes from at Rincon, uh, the villages of Topamai and Ushmai, which are where Camp Pendleton is today, uh, 
we were marched, that was our trail of tears along the El Camino Real uh, that we were forcibly relocated to our reservations from. Uh, and the beginning of Jacinda, who's the woman speaking in the film, uh, she's a Kuya woman, um, she's talking about how they knew that our food systems and how our societies functioned in relation to the ocean was our strength, that was our fire. So by separating us from our water, our Paula, that is how we were able to be divided and societally weakened. Um, and even today, aside from the ocean, I highly recommend checking out the movie Once We Had a River. It's about the river that runs through the Lasagna Reservation. It's called the San Luis Rey River. And once we had one, we don't anymore. And that's because of dams. Uh, and just to put it into relative time perspective, the talks around intergenerational trauma and things that happen to Native communities and are so prevalent in most Native, all Native communities, uh, I like to remember that we have a word in my language for bison. And that means that we've been around since the bison were in San Diego County. So when we say since time immemorial, we don't mean the 14,000 year fossil record that everyone references, we mean since time immemorial. And that means that we have an intergenerational memory of the ocean for much longer than we have intergenerational trauma. Uh, so that's what the ocean means to me, is strength. So I think a quick takeaway from everyone's kind of thing of what they had to share about the ocean is find your ocean, find your home. Um, one I, thing that you kind of mentioned was, um, I think you were talking about the woman in the film speaking of how she understood the importance of the relationship of water to people and that the ocean provides for us um, being that it's a food source and, you know, it's a travel way. It's a way to get around. Um, and on the note of it being a source for us, there's this give and take relationship with the ocean. So, you know, we as people cannot continue to take and take and take from it because eventually the ocean will say no more. So how do we as a community, as individuals from our different cultural backgrounds, how do we give back to the ocean to protect the ocean? And why is that important to each of you and either how it relates to allowing you to be able to surf where you surf um, or just general protection of the ocean and keeping it clean and you know allowing it to thrive the way that it is or the way that it should be? Uh, that's a good question. Um, as you guys know, San Diego's a lot more populated than here. And as some of you may or may not know, there's 17 reservations in San Diego County, and none of them are on the coast. Um, and so let's just say we're an hour out, the reservations that are, that are there are an hour out. So I get a lot of calls from conservation groups that say, oh, hey, I want you guys to be on these different boards of conservations and environmentalists. And I see the environmentalists as our closest allies, but at the same time, it's like we can't have advocates until we're really having fun and playing at the beach as a community. And so when I started this program 20 years ago, it was just for us just to show up first, to start to like feel comfortable in an area that is dominated by high real estate or people that don't look like us or you know, not remembering because there was an interruption between us as coastal people and now. So the idea was let's get there first, let's start to feel comfortable in this coastal environment and of course surfing is one of the greatest ways that we could have fun and, and what's going to draw us back so we can start to repopulate or regenerate these areas so we can become advocates for conservation at a greater type of um, uh, numbers or position. So that's still because a lot of the folks, of course, in their own communities are dealing with their own stuff out on the reservation, their own issues. 
So like coming all the way to the coast to start talking about like saving the beach or saving this, it's, it's theoretically noble, but the fact that are we really there enjoying these habitats? And until we can say we're starting to do that, we start to feel a vested interest again. So for me and, and the program, that's one of the big things. Let's get, get in the water, let's start to have fun and, and play so we can want to come back. And because I've been doing it for such a long time, we have youth who now have children who are now teenagers, and, and you see in their posts and different stuff, they're, they're gathering a lot more at the beach, at these places that, that again, that we, we are just a part of that reintroduction in a very populated area, you know, like Southern California. So for me, you know, um, we need that representation within conservation, and that's usually something that I find that our environmentalist allies seem to miss, that we could save indigenous species when it comes to plants and animals, but we are left out of the conversation. Just when we're gonna regenerate or, or uh, have this type of justice around this, these areas that we want to repopulate in nature. We need like fenced off areas so we could be there to grow and repopulate. When I say fenced off areas is because usually they'll put like a string or something around or something for something to rehabilitate. We need these areas to rehabilitate. And that's one of our, what I feel is our glass ceiling in our work, especially me in Southern California, is that we don't have those spaces yet that we can have our, our storage for our canoes and these spaces where we can gather where there's not a gatekeeper. Yeah. We have to call somebody, hey, can you open for us? Or we have to fight to scratch? Or can we leave our stuff here? Because in order for it to be a cultural practice again, it has to be consistent. It has to be convenient. It has to be just like we were there before, where we're not having to bring things from storage. And, and you know, it has to be a consistency in order for us to regain our practice, and then we're going to see momentum. And that's what we're, what we're after. Um, I'm going to pass the mic over to, to Liam, because Liam's doing a lot of stuff in, in regards to what I'm kind of talking about. Shit, man. Um, yeah, I think that everything Mark just said is pretty spot on, uh, and he is definitely the fun guy at the beach for our community. He, is, yeah, he puts on the most fun activities, but branching away from having fun at the beach and, you know, being in that space that is predominantly white and very wealthy, uh, there's all sorts of things happening right now from, I mean, humble to Imperial Beach uh, around not wanting the general public to have beach access, you know, ending of access easements, uh, ending of conservation statuses. Uh, there's, there's lots of things happening, both good and bad. Uh, but the real bridge between native people and local governments, state governments, and federal governments that oversee coastal resources really lies in the fact that there is not a lot of resources for these communities to engage uh, civically with decision makers um, because their communities at home are in so much need of help uh, and their population numbers while rapidly declining are top heavy on age population levels so you have a community of say 1,000 people 75 percent are over 55 with a life expectancy of 60 and most almost 80% of the homes are single parent homes. You're more concerned with your next meal, who's taking your kids to school. You're not concerned with the multimillionaire's property getting kind of trashy on their private beach access because you don't even have time to go to the beach. So when we talk about indigenous representation in coastal land management and con conservation, uh, it really needs to be something that is thoughtful and meaningful and not tokenizing because so much of the time, all these advisory boards, all these bodies of, you know, advisory committees uh, are really just, their recommendations are taken with a grain of salt. There's no documentation for the rationale on why we're not gonna listen to them. 
they're really just there so that the people can put uh, a, you know, a brand together uh, of their, their social justice. So when it comes to Native communities being able to access these spaces, it lies within resources, but when it comes to Native communities actually being able to have some say and control over these places that are very sacred, um, and that when a building goes up, they're legally required to consult with our tribes just to put pipe in the ground. Um, but when actual use of natural resources occurs, we're completely out of the loop most of the times. Um, and I, I would say that, you know, to leave it off, it's, it's really just about having our next generation learn how to speak that language of, of law and public resource code and understanding that engaging with your elected leaders and engaging with decision makers and engaging with donors and people who can actually make a change in the world is rooted in the fact that we live in a capitalist society. That's not gonna change. I mean, it's wishful thinking to think that it could in some shape or form, but it's not gonna change. So that's really the language that our communities will have to speak when it becomes a priority for them. But right now it's unfortunately, it's not the highest priority. Thank you. That was a lot, um, but honest. And so much of what even here, like in our tribe's homeland that we deal with all the time. So I think any indigenous culture has to deal with all of that stuff. And I think that's a lot to unpack in not a space that we have time to unpack all of that right now, unfortunately. But I would very much encourage all of you to be more curious about about what doesn't happen with indigenous cultures. And I'm saying that the right way. What doesn't happen because there's so much, sorry if I get emotional, um, there's so much that's overlooked or kind of like one of the words that you mentioned is like being a token, right? I'm sure we all, we all have our backgrounds and we all have different stuff that we go through you know, a lot of us come from mixed backgrounds and, you know, it's fine, but being recognized sometimes as a token, like, oh, you know, you have your token Chumash or your token whatever cultural background you come from is kind of rude and demeaning. And it hurts. And it's only said so that people can say, yes, like so that the county can say, yes, we talked to these people and we included them, included them in the conversation so that they can feel like they have a say. But at the end of the day, they don't always take what you have to say into account because at the end of the day, when it comes to in this area, when we're dealing with the county, the county's gonna do what they want. And as long as we feel like we had some part in it, well then that's okay. But if we don't get enough recognition to actually influence the decision making and actually make a difference, nothing is going to change. Um, and that's just the raw truth of it. Um, so thank you for sharing all of that. Um, anyway, moving on from that, um, I do kind of the last question that I had that was something that I was curious about is what inspired each of you on the journey that you are with Native Like Water? So you founded it, you started it. How, you know, did that start and how has it been on the journey to get where you are today and how each of you kind of joined? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Like I said before, my, my main goal in the beginning was just let's see what it feels like and looks like for us to regather on the beach. And so the, my program that I have is a two week, I have a few programs, but the, the two week summer program that we have, we hold in La Jolla down in San Diego. If, if any of you are familiar with La Jolla, it's a very upscale area. There's a university there on the cliffs that's Kumeyaay territory and it was all built on, on Kumeyaay village sites. and burial sites. And I wanted to bring our folks 
back home. And even though it's not just for Kumeyaay, it's an intertribal program. So we have folks from all tribes coming there. And just to feel what it looks like, see what happens when the memory kicks in. And that's kind of what took us on this journey again with that memory. And it wasn't till about eight years ago that I really realized why I was doing it, even though I'm telling you why I did it, but I was doing it for me because I was trying to have return these youth to the, to the ocean and I didn't even really know my total history. I was doing this as a service to the local San Diego community, but I was doing it for myself until I found out eight years ago again, until when I went to Mexico and I met my, my mother's people and my grandmother's area and I realized, oh my God, this is where I'm from. This whole time, these 20 years, I've been trying to make my way back to the ocean and find my story. So that was a part of it. And what's the, there's a lot of stuff in here that I wish I had time to talk about. It's only 15 minutes. But you see that ship, that's the San Salvador. That's the ship that uh, carried Cabrillo. You guys have heard of Cabrillo, right? He's up here too, I think, right? So Cabrillo came and he's the one that was, you know, kind of credited for discovering San Diego or California or whatnot. He came on that ship. That voyage that he did um, was a voyage that started, well, the last vo one of his last voyages that started in Mexico, in Colima, Michoacan, where this film was also shot, where I'm from as well. And so that, I always wanted to see, what if we can get back on those ships, take over those ships and get back on with an intertribal group and go backwards. Go back to see how our tribal people are doing along that coast, along what I call the superhighway. Because if you get on a, on, a, on a boat, depends on what time of year, and you have no engine, you'll end up with the current, you'll end up down in Costa Rica in two weeks, just with the current. That's a superhighway. You know, the Humboldt current goes from Humboldt all the way down there, and then on the other time, the whales follow that same current, the dolphins, the birds, so do we. And that there's a super highway that connects us, even though that's 1,500 miles away. So part of this is in the narrative and the seed money for this film came from the One Ocean program from the World Surf League, it has this thing called One Ocean. It's an environmental arm of the World Surf League. And I, they says, you know, if I, get this, if I get a small grant, what would be the most important thing I could do? Because they always call us for beach cleanups and all kinds of stuff. You know, I don't want to be the poster kid for the beach cleanup with the little tear in, you know, the Indian with a tear. <laughs> I don't want to do beach cleanups. So even though I, they're important, I was like, I, we need to change the narrative. We need to be seen. We need our own people to see ourselves in this area. Because growing up, I was always, you know, uh, ridiculed by my native and Chicano brothers and sisters for surfing. Like, oh, you just want to be white. You just want to hang out with the white people. And it wasn't the truth. I was getting back to my cultural practice. And so this, this whole thing is about the narrative, about us being visible, which is interesting because the surfers that you see, honestly, there's, the, there's I know like 10 surfers that are indigenous people from Southern California and they're all on the film. You know, they're, and they represent Orange County, they represent San Diego, Riverside. Even the Kawea girl that's in the front, I didn't want to put people's tribal names on there because there's a lot of divisions. I wanted everybody to feel like it was their story. And the Kawea girl that's on there as the grandmother, she's from Palm Springs, but even Palm Springs, the ocean would come all the way up from the Sea of Cortez and would come all the way up. So even their tribe were coastal people were their waterfront people, you know? And we mentioned, one of the things we mentioned there was the, was the Hawaiian connection, the rain, what we call the Rainbow Bridge that's in our oral history, that we had already this connection with Hawaii from before Columbus. So we brought a lot of little pieces in there together, and there's, there's Hawaiian in this film as well. But I just wanted to mention that because First things first is we have to understand what the real story is. That's what, the, what we call the reckoning, dead reckoning. We have to know where we're going to start with this to move on, to move on with discussions of conservation or discussions of, 
of anything. We need to know where at least we began. You know, we call this Turtle Island. And uh, this, this current, these turtles, they, they've been following us. Even in San Diego, they've been appearing as we've been on our journey. They, you know, the people don't usually see turtles in San Diego that much. So the fact that they're popping up when we're on the ship, when we're doing stuff out there, we understand that we are regenerating something that is way older than us. Because one of the things that we all believe as indigenous people, at least the ones that I've spoke with in the, Amer in the Turtle Island, is that we come from the stars. We come from the Milky Way. You know, and that's mostly carbon and water. Right? Mostly carbon and water and salt as humans. So, you know, I just wanted to put all those things together for you guys. Well, for me, it kind of goes the same way. That was, um, I, I really like to see how the narrative is changing, how this tradition that it was imposed to us, you know, that what Mar was saying, kind of like only white people goes to surfing. And I get a lot of joy seeing, like, for example, down in Michoacan with there's uh, kids that are five, seven, eight, nine years old, and they, they're surfing. And they're indigenous uh, kids from the, from the region. Um, that this happened in Tikla, Michoacan, where a lot of uh, surfers come from all over the world. And you can count probably with one hand, you know, the surfers, the adult surfers that, that are there, that are professionals and, and, and are coming up in the competitions to around, you know, all the other uh, people that comes from, from different countries. But um, those, you know, three, four, five surfers, one of them was right here in the film. Um, and they're, they're inviting the kids together with Mark and, and the program that we have. And we have, uh, yeah, all these kids coming around. So I like that, to change that narrative, to show them that the ocean is theirs and they belong to the ocean. And, and change this idea that me as a Mexican, you know, I grew up when the mother tells you, don't get in the water because you got to get sick. Don't get wet, you got to get sick. And, and so seeing those kids being in the water and dominating you know, the, 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 the art of surfing and all that stuff. And I see them in the Sasquatch. The Sasquatch oh. is, <laughs> is a, I don't know if you know the Sasquatch, but you can, you can explain it. to them. But I see while I'm preparing their food and all that, I see them way out there. And there's like 10 of them that go in the, in the Sasquatch. And even me, you know, I, I've been in that program and I go, oh my God, they, they came off of the Sasquatch. I see those little heads, you know, swimming around and I go like, are they go going to be okay? And, and all of a sudden I see that they go up in the Sasquatch like in a minute, you know, a second, they all, all there, safe. So for me to see that is big. It's really big to see, you know, those little kids, those little indigenous kids, just like me, you know, being there and being brave when they're that little. So. <laughs> so I'll explain what a subsquatch is. <laughs> um, it's a 14 foot, uh, 16 foot, thank you. It's a 16 foot uh, stand up paddle board where like you sit, six to eight people on it and you all paddle into waves and catch waves together. It's a massive blow up board. Um, I, uh, our brothers in Hawaii uh, started, um, started making these uh, to compete in the big wave contests and stuff like that. And, and they've been taking out, we were super fascinated by it. And I love the thing so much. Um, it is the craziest feeling uh, on there. And like, like Luce was saying, we, we take the kids out on it, out into the ocean, and we did a few uh, programs down by Tikla with uh, some of the gnarliest kids I've ever met, because they're like, 
they're all these little indigenous kids who are like all surfers and want to be out in the water and don't are like diving into the ocean picking up lobsters and stuff like that and they're all like they're all like under 10 or something like like <laughs> like all these little these little warriors and um the the sub squatch has always been to me because I started um, I started training to uh, to pilot it almost like two years now, um, and it's always been to me a a way to bring people into a community setting where the world around us is chaotic. It's it's it, you have to rely on each other, but it's very safe. Um, when you're on it, you're in a different world. And I've noticed that a lot of times, whenever we catch a wave, no matter how big, it could be the sh the tiniest thing ever, like ankle high wave that we catch with it. You feel like you're going like 90 miles an hour. And then you look at the video that people take of you and you're moving like a snail. You're not, you're not, even, you're not even moving and everyone's just screaming like, ah, and we're just going. And all the kids do the same thing. and. And like um, like Luce was saying, um, they actually saw them on, at the very end when the credits were going up. You saw the kid; those were all kids at the sunset. Um, and I remember when I like less than six years ago, the like when I first met them, there was like one or two in the water. And I came back like three years later, and there was like thirty of them, <laughs> all surfing in the white water, all like learning this. And I was really happy to see that because um yeah it's it's it was it was a strange like mindset mindset shift um from the last time i went there was a few uh surf contests that um that i participated in and also uh judged for uh that the people that Tikla put on um and people from around the world come to that contest and there's like yeah like like lou said like one two or three uh, native uh, individuals who came to compete in the surf contest and they always like top three. They're always top three, but the the interest in surfing wasn't as big as it became over time. And I saw the, the inspiration that the kids got from seeing the adults out there ripping it, like destroying the competition. And, and that was one of the most enlightening feelings for me. And so back to the question, uh, what made me come on to do it. I've been part of the program for a long time since I was born, but I didn't truly become a part of like the staff, staff, like going out there and training and doing all that for like only the last like four years maybe total. Um, and so the reason I went there is for my health, but also I knew that I needed to reconnect to that part of me that was getting severed because I was living in San Diego and I was doing work, I was going to college, COVID hit, it was just a bunch of stuff. And I was like, I'm losing that part of myself. I grew up in the Amazon, I grew up in the, not the Amazon, but the, <laughs> the rainforest in Central America and Panama. And I grew up around the ocean like constantly. And after I moved back to California, I stopped going as frequently. And I realized that I wasn't feeling as happy. I was getting stressed all the time. I was very, I was very down on myself. I, everything was, everything was a problem that I was trying to fix. And so as soon as I, I went back to that state of mindset where like I just had to let things go, things started working for me again. And that's, that's the reason I went back is to find those happy, joyful moments and experience them with the kids. Cause no matter how much they fear the ocean, you get on a sub squatch where you have a community and they all help each other. At, by the end of it, they want to go out there with a little board, like into 19 foot waves, and I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> so it's a crazy experience, but I enjoy every step of the way with it. Um, yeah, my what inspired me to get involved with in Native Like Water? That is a really cool memory for me, actually. Um, I at the time was working for. The Department of Water Resources Tribal Policy Advisor for the state of California here and I wanted to volunteer and give back to community and I wanted to do something that wasn't depressing um, so I called my grandpa and I asked him I was like do you know any native programs that do like surf stuff because I really want to do surf stuff I was a surf instructor for like really short time out of out of college after I graduated from Santa Cruz, so I, I basically just, I wanted to do that. And he connected me with Mark. Like I said, I saw those pictures on his website, and I was like, oh, he does know my grandpa. 
Um, and so I called Mark up. He didn't answer. He called me back uh, <laughs> after the first time I called him. And he was like, yeah, like, you know, we'd love to have you help out. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, you know, like, when's the next San Diego program? And I was like, checking the website, it's outdated by like two years. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm, like <laughs> I'm like, when's the next San Diego program? Your dates seem to be in 2020 and it's 2022. And um, he was like, well, actually, like, we're going to do a trip uh, to. Mexico, and I was like, oh, like Cabo? And he's like, eh, more like Mutual Con. <laughs> and I was like, that sounds really fun. And you know, like I get on my phone, Google where Mitra Khan is, and you know, El Chapo's son was just like arrested there a month beforehand. So I was like, you know, this, this sounds like nothing can go wrong. Um, and Mark reassured me, he was like, this is really chill, don't worry. He's like, it is a completely indigenous community down here. And he said, it's the Nahua community. And my language family, Palm Quichum Chomtila, is Uto Aztecan. Um, and Nahua is also Uto Aztecan. It's the same language family. Um, there's a lot of different variations that it doesn't mean I can understand it at all. It's completely different, but it is the same language family. And I was fascinated and I was like, God, it'd be crazy to do this. You know, my mom's like, you're not going down there, are you? I was like, mm, I don't know. And eventually I, I did it. I went down there and um, I went for the Tikla Pro competition that Eamon, wow. Eamon was talking about. And that's where I met Mark for the first time was after a, what? yeah, it was after a, a, a three and a half hour plane ride to Kalima and a two and a half hour taxi ride from Colima Airport to San Juan de Lima across the provincial border from Colima to Michoacan. And I just spent three days there because the Tribal Water Summit was literally the Monday after I flew out on Sunday and I had to be out in Sacramento. And so I showed up with a nice tan, that was awesome. Um, but we were there and I just absolutely fell in love with the mission. Um, Mark's vision is, it's incredible. His spirit is like no one else I've ever met. Everyone that he surrounds himself with is just an absolute gem of a human being, uh, excluding Eamon. I know. <laughs> and um, yeah. I, I, I just, I completely was taken over. And really what got me, you know, I hate to be the, the fourth guy in the lineup to talk about the Subsquatch, but really what got me was, was I got there and they were like, dude, wait till you see the Subsquatch. And I was like, the what watch? And they're like, the Subsquatch. And they told me what it was. And I was like, a six person surfboard. I'm like, so what do you, I want what you guys are having. Cause like, I've never seen a six person surfboard. Like I want, I want to see that. Like, what do I have to take to see that? And no, it was, it was real. It was a six person surfboard. And, uh, I got on it and I, I still show people the video yeah, of the GoPro footage. Um, Did we flip that first? No, oh, good. no. We had the guy with the Batman mask oh, on. Oh yeah, Batman. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, really cool. I'm surprised you didn't put it in the film. In the film. And um, yeah, so once I got back to San Diego, basically just like hounded Mark, um, to see when the next San Diego program was. The San Diego program was like a few months later. I helped out with that. And then, you know, they came and they did subsquatch services for my tribe's annual native youth gathering that we hold at a beach in Camp Pendleton that you, you know, normally need to be either military personnel to get on, but we have an MOU with them because we have a cultural resource agreement and cult consultation protocol agreement with them to monitor our tribal cultural resources on site. And, you know, now to this day, Rincon Indian Education Center has a subsquatch. Um, and that's because of Mark Chavez. So that's like one of the biggest pieces that I can say you've left on my life and all of the lives of those little native kids from Rincon and, and other tribes um, because it's, it, it wouldn't have happened because of you. That's huge. Um, 
I think the takeaway from all of that is that we should all try a sub squatch. Yeah, yeah. If you all have the opportunity, just try it. It sounds like a lot of fun. Um, thank you all so much for sharing. Um, you know everything from like all your personal feelings of the film and just your guys' journey. We really appreciate that. Um, I do want to take some time to just kind of field questions from the audience. If anybody has any questions, I'll run the mic around. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Yeah, we have time for two or three. What time tomorrow are we writing? <laughs> well, if you go to our website, it is, it is, it is not, it, it, it is updated, it's very current. <laughs> but if you go to our website, you can see under surf therapy, you can see the subsquatch, and you can actually book the subsquatch, we'll come up, we do travel with it, so it, we can come up and do, um, do groups and stuff, so. We don't have it with us here, we normally stay with it, but yeah, it's it. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good point because we do cruise with it, we do groups, and it's a sort of thing called surf therapy, and we're, we're just we're taking people to the flow state pretty quick with that. Mm. It's nicer than like just pushing people on a, on a wave with just one board, because you're on there with a group, and there's no like that safety in numbers and stuff, so it's been working really well. Other question? Anybody? How are you building the bridge between the people that are um, thinking that they're doing well for you, how are you getting them to see your vision? Oh, that's a good question. I, I think I, can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, like you have these people that want, that are um, trying to uh, make sure they tick the boxes, uh -huh. right, by having, saying they spoke to the indigenous people, people oh. that are trying to, let's say, take oh. care of the land, oh. right? And you're trying to um, create this space right. of, of bringing back your people, right. our pe all our people, right. right, everyone. And so how do you bridge that? Because it's like two different languages. They're yeah. thinking one, they're on one street and you're on another. So how are you yeah. bridging that? That is a great question. And that's kind of why I turned to art and turned to film, because there is things that I want people to kind of get and feel that I just can't speak and tell folks. And, and I think, again, the narratives and us by us telling our story, and I'm hoping people in here have felt a little bit about it. This is, I feel, just the beginning. Um, I'm not aware of other indigenous surf films that exist within California, there might be, but um, I, I wanted to touch kind of the environmental allies out there. I wanted to touch the surf community. You know, we're not like super pros, as you can see, we're not doing errors and stuff, but I did want to make a, a movie that I could say that was uh, hold, held integrity to, to surf films, where you could at least enjoy the surfing. Um, and so, I want to be able to, to speak that language, I guess you could say, of, of, of being true to, to surfing, to, to the surf film, be true to, to our teachers, that we've, what we've been taught, and using art and our storytelling to touch more folks. Um, but to hold people accountable, kind of like what she says with the county, or even, you know, I've been knocking on the university's door for so many years, the University of California, all these people. There's somebody behind some curtain somewhere, I'm convinced. And I, don't, and I don't know, like, I don't know if I'm going to change them, but at least we could, like, and I don't want to be the guy protesting always on the negative stuff. I want to look at what it looks like to thrive, what it looks like to see ourselves in a good light and not be, like, complaining, but to, like, see what this is. And if there's only five of us that surf in Southern California that are from that particular area, like he says at that lot on the credits, all those little guys, that's what we're gonna, that's what we're creating, and it's baby steps, you know? And a lot of our, our, our mentorship, thank God, comes from Hawaii, from our uncles over there, that also, too, were part of a renaissance in the 70s and 80s that we are now benefiting from through, because they resuscitated um, through the Hokulea voyaging and through different stuff that they're doing in Hawaii, that we're lucky to have that connection and that mentorship, because there is a blueprint out there.
believe it or not. And I, one of the quotes at the end was with Hokulea. Hokulea and the Polynesian Voyaging Society is a blueprint. A lot of mentorship came from that. A lot of stuff branched out of that. And I like to think that we are one of those little seeds, you know, so we hold that very dear. And I think it's by example of what we're doing and people like Liam, who's, you're in your 20s, right, bro? You're in your late 20s? <laughs> no, but, but these guys, Shaluk, the, the main guy on the character, he's in law school at ASU now, he just graduated. So they're going right into policy. They're going right into grab the, the, the bull by the, by the horns and try to hold people accountable um, the best way we can. But again, again, it starts, the change starts with us and we need to be healthy in our mind and spirit first. And I think that's the most important thing we need to do. Because if we try to always play their game in their arena, as you know, it's, it, it's very taxing. It's tolling. I don't know if we're coming out as healthy as we need to. <laughs> um, I do kind of want to touch on your question a little bit. A lot, yes, everything that you said. And I even want to point out this space, like being allowed to come to this space and invite the community to come in to hear everybody's story. I think making sure that all indigenous cultures continue to be able to have a voice in whatever way that is, whichever way they can achieve that goal. So it's other people opening up spaces to allow for the conversations to happen because really it is continually telling your story, right? From, from your perspective, from your experience, and as many people that are willing to listen to that story, just keep telling it. Mm -hmm. And that will eventually, or the hope is, right, that eventually if you tell it enough or to enough people that they start to really understand and really feel where you know, each individual is coming from and what it means, and I think, I, I'm speaking for myself right now, but hopefully the rest of you take away that when you listen to each of them talk that you can tell they're speaking from their heart. And I think as long as, you know, the voices for, that represent each of these indigenous cultures, as long as you can tell they are speaking from their heart, that will resonate with you, and you'll be able to carry that to the next person that you want to tell or share with or whatever, and that helps kind of bridge that gap. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that makes oh. a lot of sense. Thank, thank Emma for, yeah. for, for example. Yeah. For yeah. Yeah. I, I just want to really, really, really quickly just say that, you know, as, as much as what you said is super valid, just a box checking exercise, um, which is what most of state policy has become around tribal consultation today, uh, there is also some amazing leaps and bounds that are being made. Uh, within the state. I mean, just sitting here, we have two people from two different tribes whose tribes were recipients of the Tribal Nature-Based Solutions Grant, which are 34 different awards that were given out by the California Natural Resources Agency to either repurchase land or to start projects uh, that have to do with land rematriation, management, studies, uh, or even water back uh, in the YTT Chumash case, aquaculture, economic development. Um, but all that being said, it's kind of like surfing in big waves at the end of the day, because when you start getting to a high level of sports, you're on your own out there. No one is coming to save you. And that is the same <laughs> thing for our communities. No one is going to come and save us. We're only going to do that ourselves. This is the only way we can possibly do it and not degrade our cultures. Um, I'm going to call out my friend Lydia, who's doing a program in about a month um, uh, here in this space. So I'm going to have her share a little bit about it, and then we can close that. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So I know. Um, I just want to thank you all for being here tonight. This was wonderful. Um, and you'll be hearing from us about that Sasquatch situation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm an ethnic studies professor at Cal Poly, and in about a month, we're going to be hosting an indigenous surfer symposium over the course of three days. And we have indigenous surfers and activists from New Zealand and Canada and 
um, a couple of other different places, California, who are going to be coming here um, with the goal to build relationships and talk in collaboration and consultation with YTT. Consultation is a stupid word, but we're, this, you're part of this. <laughs> this doesn't happen without you, you know. Um, and so we're, we're, we're going to be building community and talking about the ways that surfing helps us think about coastal stewardship and helps us think about activism and futures around those spaces. And one of the events happening across those three days is another conversation like this here at the museum. We're going to be having another kind of community conversation about about the intersection of surfing and coastal care and sovereignty. And we really hope that a lot of you will come back for that. The information is all on the website. Um, you can find my email on the Cal Poly website if you want to ask me questions directly. But we would love to see you um, next month for that. So thank you, Emma. Thank you.